Okay, let's get started here. Wait a minute, Let me move this over. Everybody good? Everybody hears me? Can somebody tell me? We good? <laughs> okay. Good, 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 good. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry about this week. Kind of complicated, but uh, that's that's life these days. The world seems to be a complicated place this, this week. Um, so I gave the lecture on PyTorch and gave you some sample code, and you'll have another assignment tomorrow, probably in the evening. And uh, that will involve some first attempts at, at uh, deep learning with classification. And um, so I thought it would be useful following up on that lecture, which if you've had a course in deep learning or in machine learning before, maybe you don't need to look at it. Um, but I think everybody can use a little bit of review of the material today, which is how do you just it it's so it can be so confusing to try to develop models and you're just like what's the theory here what's the principle and i've had people asking me this you know uh and i want to give you some guidance but but some of this is is um i'll give you the caveats as we get to them but basically remember that what we've got here is a situation where you're going to prepare your data in an appropriate way, okay? As we get further into the class, you'll see that the data preparation in these large language models is somewhat minimal. They're learning to do their own data preparation, but we'll continue to think about that as a, as a possible step. Then you have your data that, and, you know, honestly, like for the assignment for tomorrow, we've been looking at Shakespeare plays and, uh, just keep finding bugs, you know, in the presentation and problems. And so there's always a little bit of that. Um, but once you have your data, you split it into these three different sets, okay? You hold out a validation set, you hold out a testing set, and then most of your data goes into training. So, you know, it's hard to say, but, you know, this might be, uh, oops, sorry. This might be 70%, you know, this might be 10%, this might be 20%. Uh, you almost never use 0.1% for the testing, which we did on the last homework. I just did that for reasons of, to keep you from having problems. Um, and then um, you hold out the testing set as a kind of final exam um, while you're training. You're using the validation set as your test of how well you're doing. And then in an ideal world, what you do is you do the testing at the very end. And you do not tune these parameters uh, and have that cycle of, oh, let me change things. Let me see what I can do to make this better. You don't do that with the testing set because that's the final exam. There's nothing else to do after that. And this is a little bit funny because people always, it just feels like people don't always follow that. But in, in the ideal setting, that's what you would do. And what we're gonna do today is talk a lot about these performance metrics and basically how you would take this loop, you know, of, of running an algorithm, choosing an architecture geometry and setting your parameters and uh, or hyperparameters, I guess. Um, the difference between hyperparameters and parameters, the parameters are the weights inside the model, thousands or millions of them. The hyperparameters are things like what optimizer you're choosing, uh, what the learning rate is, to some degree, what the geometry is of the network, um, things like that. At the batch size, um, whether you've set early stuff, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that you can set. Um, and we'll consider those. 
So remember this, we have binary classification. We're talking about classification for right now. Um, that's the next homework. Binary classification, multi-class, multiple classes, but you only pick one, and multi-label, which means you can pick more than one label. Like you might say, there's a dog and a plant. You know, we've gone through this in class. So let's think about how to how to think about these. Uh, and the first part of this lecture is basically how do we um, let's see if I can adjust this a little bit. Um, how do we know how well we've done? You build a model. Uh, like here's a very typical thing: the Enron email data set. It's got an enormous amount of information. It's got 33,000 emails from this defunct company. Um, and um, it is one way of looking at it. It's been used for lots of things is let's classify it. Some of the email is spam. Some of it is not. Sometimes they call not spam. They call it ham. That's a little too clever for my taste. So I called it spam and not spam because that's the typical thing that you're doing, you have a label and the not, right? It's two, two categories, you really use one category, which we could have used in logistic regression. I typically tend to deal with this as a two output network instead of just one, it's up to you. Um, but anyway, the Enron database is an enormous, uh, very large, you can see, you know, megabytes of, of information here. And um, this is just on my machine. Um, and <clears throat> it's just, if you look at it, it's just, <clears throat> you know, a bunch of short emails, mostly short emails. And um, somebody has hand annotated them or graduate students. I don't know how they did this. Um, I, I assume it was done by humans as uh, spam or not spam. And so the labels <clears throat> are one and zero, <clears throat> very simply. And so, you know, the network is going to have the input, whatever it is, presumably some kind of term frequency or some kind of representation, uh, lots of different ways to do it, uh, input. And the output would be, you know, two two of them, two, two neurons saying spam or not spam, and you choose the largest one. That's the easiest way to think of it. You can just use cross entropy like I showed you last time. So notice that this, this data set is fairly well balanced. We're gonna have to think about that today. Uh, what does your data set look like? And what does this say about how well your model is doing? This is actually a significant issue. So there's lots of things that you've got to notice about your data when you start evaluating how well I am doing in solving this task. Um, Multi-class classification, you know, like the MNIST data set, handwritten uh, digits in a 26 by 26 black and white grid or grayscale. And uh, you know, this is the hello world of, uh, of uh, data sets. And um, it it classifies them into some number of categories. In this case, ten because there's ten digits. Sixty thousand. Uh, when you download this, you can do it very easily from Kaggle uh, or other places. Sixty thousand uh, twenty six by twenty six matrices of grayscale, and uh, I think ten thousand testings, and it's already been divided up for you. Oh, there it is. Yeah. So, you know, the the labels are going to be numbers zero to nine digits, right? And you've got this two-dimensional matrix. Uh, actually, this has been flattened. Uh, has it been flattened? Yeah, it looks flattened. You can see what the, what you have to do is um, you have to store, you just, you just go in row major order, you just flatten it, just, you know, like I talked about last time. Flatten, um, 
put it in a linear sequence, doesn't matter where, the network doesn't care. Uh, and that goes through 728 inputs. And, you know, in the end, it's going to have 10. Multi-label classification, which we're not going to talk about too much, um, but it's 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 really important in a lot of uh, in a lot of cases, like in medical diagnosis. Here's an image classifier, and you have an image, or maybe an X-ray image, or some kind of imaging of the body, and they want to identify multiple problems uh, with NLP. It might be your class, you're, you're adding keywords automatically to an article. So an article is submitted to a journal or a blog or someplace. And you want to say, okay, what are the keywords that are important? Why is this, uh, you know, to help for search in the future? Can we identify the themes, the subjects, the subheadings, you know, uh, of this piece of text? And so that's, a, that's an important uh, kind of classification. We're not going to talk about that too much. Okay, so th that's pretty much what you have with uh, classifiers. And let's go through, for the first part of this lecture, what I want to do is go through and talk about the, um, the way in which you think about what's happening with a classifier and, and then what you can do about it. But the first thing we have to understand is, in some abstract sense, what is it doing? How, how is it performing? How accurate is it? And what does accuracy mean? And is accuracy the only thing? Well, it's complicated. <laughs> the universal academic answer. Well, that depends. Um, but let's delve into, let's dig down into some of the details here. So with a binary classifier, you're trying to say it's a dog or not a dog. And there are four things that can happen to your classifier. There's only four because there's two possibilities. You have the true label, which is labeling your data, which you assume is correct. And then your model makes a prediction. So this is like why, and this is like what I've been calling why hat. What's the prediction? What's the estimation given your model of this image, this whatever? So spam, not spam, dog, not dog. Okay. Get the idea. Well, if you think of this, there's two possibilities for each. So it's going to be four combinations. Um, if you're talking about it, uh, 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 I'm going to use some examples from images that are a little more vivid. They also apply just as truly to a text. If the true label is, this is a dog, there's a dog there, and it says, your system says dog, that's a true positive. True because it's correct, okay? And it's a positive because of that positively identified the fact that there was a dog in this picture. The next possibility is it's not a dog, there's no dog in it, and your system correctly, truly says, nope, no dog. Now, this is the essence of accuracy. How many of those do you, do you, how many trues do you get out of all of your samples? That's the basic idea. The simplest thing that we can do is say accuracy. And I'll get to that in a moment because there's a bunch of them. But then there's two other possibilities, right? You might have said the, the, there might have been a dog and you failed to identify it. And that means your answer was false in a negative sense. It, it's a false negative. This, this refers to, you know, the positive and negative refers to what you're saying. Positive dog, negative not dog, negative not dog positive dog. And the first part is whether it corresponds. You know, what is the correspondence with the actual fact of the matter? So you can be right in a positive way. You can be right in a negative way. You can be 
wrong in a negative way. You say something is not a dog when there is a dog, and then you can be wrong in a positive way. You say there's a dog and there's no dog. So there are four possibilities here. And it gets more complicated when we have more than two cases, right? We're in the two classes. So the typical thing we do here, and I didn't put the label, this is called a confusion matrix. Confusion matrix. That's what this is. A confusion matrix is a chart of how many things you got wrong and how many things you got exactly all of these four cases. So what it would be is something like this. You'd have a list of how many of each one of them. You'd say, well, 23 true positives and 25 true negatives and 15 false negatives and eight false positives. Each one of these little sections in the matrix has a number in it. You count, you just go through and for all of the four possibilities of what the actual label is and what your model said, you just count. And the total is the total number of samples, the total number of data elements and how, you know, where, whatever stage this is. This might be the validation set. It might be the testing set. Actually, it might be the training set. We're going to do all of those things. Now, having done that, just for binary, for binary um, classification, now you can start to think about <laughs> different ways of digging into this and figuring out what goes wrong. In statistics, uh, they have names for these, type one error, type two error. I mean, this is something that pe people in statistics have studied for a very long time, 100, 100 years. We're not going to refer to that. If you've had a statistics class, you might you might think about that. Um, but intuitively, the ones that make the most sense and the ones that have an applicability um, in machine learning, accuracy is the most important one. What is accuracy? Accuracy is just the number of true positives and the number of true negatives. And what's the denominator there? It's just everything. It's the simplest one. How many did you get right? And that's, we're going to see, we're going to go through a bunch of these. But that's pretty much, people really report this quite a lot. And it's, it's an obvious example of something that makes sense to understand. But of course, it depends. Um, you can also talk about the relationship between, you know, one col one row or one column. Specificity says, of the positives, how many, just this, add up these two, how many did you get it's called the true negative. What what percentage? Wait, 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 I'm doing the wrong one. Sensitivity, sorry. Um, the true positive rate is the percentage of the positives you identified correctly. And I'll, in the next slide, I'll make clear why this might matter. Uh, precision is looking at this column. Of the ones that you said were positive, how many were actually positive? And um, then you have specificity, which is the true negative rate of the ones that you classified as negative. What's going on with my pen? Uh, of the ones that you classified as, um, this should be negatives. Wait a minute. Down here, I'm sorry, the actual negatives identified correctly. It's also called negative predictive value. And nobody ever uses that. So don't worry about that. <laughs> and even, you know, these other three, the accuracy, nobody in machine learning really uses them. But let's, I mean, not in, in, uh, in most cases. But let's consider why these might be important in a broader context. We're mostly going to think about accuracy. 
So accuracy is fairly straightforward. How many did it correct? How many did you get right? This is the most common measure in, in uh, NLP. But in situations where the cost of errors is significant, errors can cause serious harm or cost you money. It's not just you've misidentified some character in a play or you've said something is a comedy and it's a, you know, tragedy or some article is listed in some rubric and it's the wrong one. I mean, yeah, I guess that's an inconvenience. However, in medical diagnoses, in, um, you know, control systems for airplanes and drones and missiles and nuclear weapons, you know, as these systems get integrated into our infrastructure, there are serious consequences to mistakes. It's not just that something is a comedy and it really should be listed as tragedy or, oh, this song is a pop song. No, it's a rock song. Who cares? But if you're talking about cancer um, or in a natural language setting, this, this email shows that this student is at risk of suicide. This blog post says this person is at risk of being an active shooter with an IR-15. Um, leaving aside all the surrounding elements there, um, there are times when getting things wrong is significant, is important and costly, maybe deadly. So if a positive, if the test is a positive, you're looking at, a, at an image or test results and saying this patient has breast cancer, then a false negative is disastrous. You've misdiagnosing a deadly disease. So that means you want to increase sensitivity and you want to be, you, you want to really pay attention to that because it's not just accuracy because being inaccurate is different in the case of positives and negatives or just reverse it. You have a test and it says the patient does not have cancer. Then a positive, a false positive said, yeah, you don't have cancer. Don't really go home, enjoy things, you know. No, that's a bad idea, right? Um, positive is, there's nothing wrong with your landing gear. They're perfectly fine. A false positive is bad. If the landing gear are not going to come down, then it, you know, or your nuclear weapon, let's not go on about it. But the point is that, you know, mistakes can have costs that are not symmetrical and not trivial. And so in those cases, you would need to be more, you would need to consider something a little more carefully. Uh, we won't be dealing with much of this, but be aware that there are issues. Now, precision and recall. Oh, and you know, the, the recall is um, if you're querying a database, hardly earth shaking compared with nuclear weapons, but if you're querying a database of documents, you're doing a Google search and positive means that you retrieve the document, then you know, if you get something that's not exactly what you want, but it's kind of related, that's not a tragedy. It might even be a useful thing. So recall is um, is the is the name that they use for that. And you know, it, this comes from information retrieval. And precision and recall, uh, and recall is also sensitivity. Um, are often in conflict. So if you increase one, it decreases the other. And so there's a, you know, the false positive and the false negatives. Um, and you want to, this, yeah, this is also called recall. Um, you you want to balance the two. So there's a, something called the F1 score that is sometimes used. You'll see this. And it's the harmonic mean, like we did for uh, in previous cases in this class or the um, uh, perplexity. Um, when you're multiplying things, uh, you want to take the average in a multiplicative sense. And so that's that's um, harmonic mean. 
there's a ton of these and we're not going to go into much detail but i do want to point out that even if we use accuracy it's complicated for the following this is the main reason there's lots of reasons why accuracy is complicated all the reasons i just talked about you know errors are not always trivial or or symmetric so suppose we have two classifiers and I have to grade these. I don't know. I mean, I need to assign one an A and one an A minus, or I don't know. I'm just making this up. But you, this is a different, these are different uh, uh, tasks. And that's kind of fraught. I mean, it's kind of hard. You know, we have two different tasks, but live with me on this. Just humor me. Um, you have the accuracy of a four way classifier for the blobs model that I talked about on the PyTorch lecture. And it gets 90%. Okay, I think that's pretty good. And then you have the accuracy of a 10-way classification of digits, and that's 85%. Which one's better? Well, it's not so obvious. Uh, and here's why. You could say to yourself naively, um, well, 90% uh, is better than 85%. So therefore, A is more accurate. But you always have to consider what the baseline is. For example, if you're taking a multiple choice test, if you guess four answers per test, you know, per question, and assuming they're random, randomly distributed, um, just guessing randomly, you'll get 25% on average, right? Because one out of four randomly, you'll get it. So if you get a 50% on a multiple choice test in which the baseline is 25, you haven't done all that well. You haven't gotten half of them right in some sense you just did a little better than a random allocation. So you always have to consider a baseline classifier, which chooses randomly. So, and I'm gonna add another caveat, lots of caveats in this lecture. Um, a baseline classifier, which just randomly guesses, and this, that would be what your model would do before you train it. When you start your training, you've got a baseline model, assuming that the parameters are chosen randomly. It's a little bit complicated, but let's just make that assumption. Humor me. Um, hey, if it gives you random outputs, it'll be right 25% of the time for A, because there's four possibilities, and one out of four times it's going to get lucky. 10% accuracy for B because one out of 10. So this is assuming an equal distribution of classes, but, but no, it's more complicated than that. It's the percentage of the biggest class. Because think about a random model. It's gonna choose the largest class with more probability, right? So really what you have to look at is the percentage of the largest class. That's your baseline. That is your baseline. A random model is going to get it correct as often as the largest class. You can assume that's kind of the best it can do. So the punchline here is always compare your model with a suitable baseline model. And that's usually a random model uh, which charges which always chooses the largest class. That's the best it can do. So let's think about this. The accuracy of your four-way classifier is 90%. The accuracy of your 10-way classifier is 85%. But actually it turns out that B is doing better. 
and let's look at the details. Um, instead of just comparing these numbers, compare it to your baseline. What, yeah, assuming equal distribution, look at another example in a moment, then A improves on the random baseline 25% by a linear, just adding, it, it, it improves on it by 65%. Okay, B improves on a random model which selects the correct one 10% of the time by 75%. It's actually a better model. It's done a better job. B is a better model. Now, this is the most common way that people think about it in, in you know, unless they're digging into some really complicated domain specific situation. Again, like we're assuming, you know, just sort of, we're not gonna worry about anything special like cancer, you know, where something other than accuracy is meaningful. Again, for a vanilla flavored model, this is typically what people think about. Um, but statisticians have been thinking about this for like 100 years. And so um, there's a bunch of different methods that people have used that are more sophisticated. They tend to give you the same relationships. And then the numbers are important statistically. I don't know that we're going to worry about that. We're pretty much just going to use this. But I want to make you aware of the fact that it's complicated. It's complicated. <laughs> so there's uh, one way to do it is to normalize it with respect to the part that's unknown. So if 25% is known in some sense because you can guess it, then it's really this part that's in question. You don't give your model credit for doing well on the 25% it could do by guessing. You give it credit in some sense for what it needs to have some knowledge to do. So you just normalize it by the, the amount of unknown or the amount that isn't, that you don't, that you can't expect to randomly guess. And so for the kappa, it's called Cohen's kappa for A, right? Four-way classification. Um, wait, did I do this right? No, I did not. This should be 75%. Well, that's wrong. Uh, I don't want to do the calculation. This is not the main thing I want to turn, but I made a mistake here. I'll fix it. Um, but B, it turns out that, um, you know, when you do this, B still wins, but it shows that there's a, there's a, um, yeah, I screwed this up. Okay, I'll fix it uh, going forward. But there are other ways to measure this kind of, um, this kind of thing. I should have subtracted 25. Hmm. So statisticians have been arguing about this for a really long time. <laughs> and there's a, a lot of a lot of different ways to do it if you want to be precise. Um, there's something called the Matthews correlation coefficient. This is a paper from 2021, which is compares all these methods and they argue for something. And here it is in terms of the, uh, it's called the Matthews correlation coefficient. Um, and they compare it with the other ones, uh, other ways of doing it. The Breyer score is actually a mean square error. Uh, so lots of ideas here, but we tend to use percent improvement over a baseline model, which always chooses the largest class. So again, quick check. Suppose you have a spam, not spam, binary classification task, but, but your data is heavily unbalanced. Not the case in the Enron, it was very close, 51 to 49. But suppose for whatever reason, your, your data set is unbalanced. 30% uh, is spam and 70% is not spam. Spam filters caught some already. And you train two different models. 
and A gets 80% accuracy and B gets 92. How much better is it? Well, now you got to use 70% as your baseline. So the baseline model would say that all samples are not spam and it would be wrong. It would be correct 70% of the time. So, you know, the standard answer would say that B is 22% above the baseline, doesn't sound all that great. And A is 18% above, it's not great. And, you know, if B gets 82, 92%, you think, oh, that's a great model. No, no, because 70% is the floor, not zero. So you can see why balanced data sets are, are really important, if you can possibly get them. Now, um, you can now talk about the same things with multi-class classifiers. I'm not going to talk about multi-label. That's even more complicated. And basically, you can create large confusion matrices that instead of having just four different numbers, because there's two classes and two, you know, two actual classes, two predicted classes, now you could have any number of classes, you know, the same number, so it's going to be a square. But you just you just say, okay, for all of these different classes, for every different classification that was done on this, on this, you have the true labels. And he, up here, you have the predictions. And just to give you some simple sense of how this works, suppose, um, the reference is, this is the reference data, testing one, two, three, blah, 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 blah. Okay, now the test, when you perform, you know, think of letters as labels, right? 26 different or uh, more than that, because we have spaces and digits. Um, in any case, 30 some labels. The reference is, this is the reference data along this side. And this is, you know, there were some mistakes made, right? You can see that the mistake is made there, mistake is, and so forth. So when you do that, you find that the correct labels, the accuracy is the, is the number that are identified perfectly correctly divided by the total number of samples, size of your data that you're testing it on. But then you have these interest, this interesting information, and uh, you can calculate. Um, there are ways to to calculate these other uh, values basically by doing it row by row or column by column. We're not going to worry about that. But what's interesting is you can just look and see what has happened. You can see that this number is pretty big. Why did a bunch of the ones that should be E? Why did they get turned into eyes, okay? For example, in the um, in the MNIST digit recognition task, here's the confusion matrix for a typical run of this. Um, if you look at where the errors are, they're pretty small, but, but then there's some that look a little bigger, like this one. Oh, let me do... Let me do this. Red. This one is kind of big, and this one's kind of... It looks like the true label of three, three got confused with five, three got confused with seven, and three got confused with eight. Well, you can see why eight and three might be confused. I don't know. Three looks like seven or I don't get the five and somehow, I don't know. I don't know about the five, but you can see that this is giving you some information, right? About how things can go wrong. Uh, the fact that six and one look like each other, you know, I don't, but you can dig into your data. This is another way of exploring your data to figure out why things went wrong. Now I'm talking about images, but the same thing can happen it's a little lot more obvious to think about this with images, simple images like the MNIST. And 
you know, they they can come up with the accuracy, which is just the number that lie on the main diagonal. They have all these different ways of uh, of talking about these very complicated metrics. We're pretty much going to use accuracy. Okay. So accuracy over your basin. Now I want to talk about what is probably the most important thing you have to think about when you're designing a model for deep learning. Your goal, your overall goal. And it's a deeper, more significant issue than just a high accuracy. And in fact, if you're going to get high accuracy in a useful model, you'll need to think about this issue. And it's called generalization. And it's the ability of your neural network to learn the patterns, to learn your data, so it performs well on data it's never seen. And if you think of what I've said in lecture, Basically, language is this infinite set of all things that people would say are right. And we now we have a sample, our data set. And we're trying to extract from that finite data set the characteristics of this infinite language. An impossible task, of course. But the ability of a neural network to do that um, is that it can generalize from the information it has to this larger set. And the main problem that you face is overfitting. And overfitting, simply put, is memorizing. It is memorizing the data set. So in this class, and I've said this several times, right? If you just memorize everything I say and memorize everything on the slides, I don't know how well you can do actually in programming assignments, but if I gave you a test and I just asked you to reproduce things that were on slides, uh, you do fine. But have you learned it? Can you generalize when you're given something you've never seen before? You know, there's always this tension when we're testing in a class as teachers. You know, do we just have them have students just repeat something we said, or do we make them think? and generalize. And you sort of want to balance between the two. You don't want to do just one or the other. But the same thing is true if, with our learning, you know, uh, is true with networks. And you don't want it to just memorize the training set because then it gets 100% of the training set, but it hasn't learned the underlying patterns. It's done too much work. Memorizing, you know, if you have a math book and you just memorize every exercise, that takes a whole lot more work than understanding the principles so that you can generate the examples. Let me give you another example, a neural example. Your memories are not stored in your head as some video. You know, the, the, the episodes of your life, the immense amount of information that's come in, is not stored there in some absolute sense. There are things are stored, parts of the memories are, re are stored and they are recreated. So they're stored in a much less dimensional way than like the video of what happened to you five years ago. Now you can remember what happened five years ago because you remember certain key elements of it and then your brain reconstructs it. <laughs> um, and that's what's going to happen in a neural network. In our brains or in an artificial neural network. So what is overfitting in a, in, a, in, a, in a sense of if we have a two-dimensional set here and we're trying to learn uh, this boundary between these examples, of course, we're going to get two of them wrong, but that's life. It's not going to be perfect. Um, that's what we want to learn, that there's a boundary between these two kinds of points. And then there's a couple of exceptions, which don't really matter. They're outliers. 
And if we memorize exactly how to exclude, then we're not actually learning to, to get it 100% correct we're not actually learning the data because what's gonna happen, we go off and now we're given a new data set that we haven't seen, either the validation set or the testing set. Let's just talk about the validation set because test is the final exam, right? Then we're not learning the patterns. We're not learning the actual general information that's present in the data. We're trying to learn the general principles, the general patterns, not the exact details. The information is not in the exact details, it's in the relationship between details. Now just think about your own experience in learning in, in being in school for how many years now. So the way we see this um, in, in uh, the prediction, what happens, and I showed you in the chart, in the, um, the lecture, we saw these charts where you plot over time, you plot the loss value. How much, what's the error, the cumulative or maybe the average error uh, as you train? And we want this, we don't want to just look at this at the very end. We want to understand what's happening as we train. And what will typically happen is at some point, you'll get a robust fit. You'll get this you'll you'll be learning more and more about the data more and more more details more patterns more that and then at some point what's going to happen is the training curve will go down and the validation curve will go up they will separate why the validation is you haven't seen it during training so you're not training to the test that's the test that comes at the end of every epic. And now you're the reason that these are separating is that you are memorizing the data in the training set. So this sounds bad, doesn't it? Actually, it's not. And we'll talk about why in a moment. But basically, you see this all the time. Uh, this is actually in the MNIST data set. Uh, you start running it and Here's the training and validation loss. You can see that they've separated. The, um, the loss, the, the, the metric here is sort of irrelevant, but the point is that the, um, the, the training loss has gotten less and less and less and less. It's just learning more and more and more and more little details about the data. But you've done worse and worse on the validation, the quizzes that you have during the semester, the midterm, the two midterms, you're not doing as well on those because you're just memorizing the data. And at the same time, if you if you look at accuracy, what's going to happen is your accuracy is going to get really good because you're going to correctly identify all of the pieces. But then when you go to your validation set, you're going to reach some limit. And again, there's going to be a difference between these two. And this one is the important one. That's likely to be a pretty good indicator of where your final accuracy is when you take the final exam. So it's this separation between memorizing the data, reducing the error by learning more and more about the data, and not doing as well on the training, that seems like an incredible problem. And, you know, this will happen. It's not a problem. I mean, it's a problem we want and we will deal with. But a neural network can learn any data you give it if it has enough power, if it has enough neurons and it has enough parameters. Maybe it's deep enough or wide enough, whatever. It has enough power, discriminating power, to learn anything. Here's an example. Suppose you randomly permute the labels. You take your whatever it is. Now, this happens to be the MNIST data set. And you just randomly permute them. Now, there's no actual relationship between them. 
still <laughs> a powerful enough model will learn the training set. Um, but look what happened. I mean, you know, you keep getting more and more and more and more accurate. It may not get up to 100% because it's nonsense. Um, but your validation accuracy <laughs> goes down to about 10%. Why? Because it's random. That's your baseline. One in 10. All it can do is randomly guess. Right? Now, the loss, it's not clear what the metric is. But again, you can see that it's the training loss is getting lower. It's going to have trouble getting down to zero because there isn't actually any information there. But this phenomenon will happen if your model is powerful enough. So overfitting is often due to noisy data. Um, in NLP, it's you know misspellings and abbreviations and weird stuff in tweets. Um, it can be mislabeling person who labeled it or the phenomena. I mean, for example, in tweets, uh, an interesting source of labels is the emojis. People are, are labeling their own data, right? And uh, that's a label. Well, what if you hit the wrong one, you know, or you make a mistake? Um, noisy data and images is sort of easier. You know, what is this? What is that thing? Who knows? What is that? Who knows? It's just weird stuff that can interpret. And then sometimes you're going to have mislabeled data. The other possibility is um, there are rare features, lots of things that can go wrong. And one is rare features. For example, in the image situation. Um, there's something called Getty Images. You've probably seen this. Um, there are these public databases of billions of images, right? And um, it might say Getty Images. You, you may have seen this in um, when uh, Mid Journey or something generates an image. It might put a little, it might have a little thing in the corner that says Getty Images or some image database. Um, but if if one of the images has Getty images, or you have an email and there's a misspelled word or a tweet and it's misspelled uniquely, and it's a negative or a negative review, but they misspelled the name of the movie. Well, then the neural network will assume that that's an indicator because the only place that occurs is in this one place. And it's gonna assume that that always indicates a negative review or whatever it is, or Getty images are all about soccer players because the three that it saw from soccer, you know, had Getty images logo. That's a problem. Spurious correlations um, is actually more common. Um, and that is statistical flukes. For example, maybe there's some word that occurs in 58% of the positive reviews and only in 42% of the negative reviews. The neural network would give this work, this, this word, undue weight in learning the data sense, set. And, and that's not generalizing. That's a random occurrence, which is setting off. It's like typos in a textbook, which I know you all love, right? Uh, typos in homework assignments or solution sets. They send you off in the wrong direction. Right. You can make an, a lot of analogies with your own learning, I think. OK, let's just dig into, for a moment, some sort of philosophical, mathematical uh, ideas here. I think this is interesting, giving it a, a, a context. The manifold hypothesis sounds fancy, but it's really a manifold. You have this high dimensional space. And a manifold is a set of points that exists in many, 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 many dimensions. But it really has a representation in way fewer dimensions. Good example of this is uh, words, embeddings. 
and we're going to talk more about these as we go forward, but an embedding for a word can be a hundred number, hundred dimensional space, 300, you know, you can, and there's a dense vectors. And um, if you think about all the words in the English language and a, you know, one hot vector, maybe, you know, in common usage, 200,000, 150,000 words. That's 150,000 dimensions, but really the words exist in a much smaller dimension. You can describe them. They are, they really exist in a, in a much more real sense in a lower dimensional space. So basically you want a set of points in N dimensional space, which is really can be represented is isomorphic to is the same shape as a lower dimensional space that is Euclidean, that is continuous. There's a notion of distance, you can interpolate and everything you wanna do with the information, because what you're doing when you're generalizing, you're interpolating between points and you're trying to understand the shape of the information. So if you have, you know, a piece of string, yes, it exists in three dimensions or here in two dimensions, but if you stretch it out, it's really just one dimension. The extra two, extra one dimension or in the real world, extra two dimensions don't really matter. A crumpled piece of paper is in 3D, but if you spread it out, it's actually two dimensions. And um, Mobis strip has one, one side, right? It exists in three dimensions. So, the manifold hypothesis is sort of a philosophical notion is that many high dimensional data sets in the real world actually lie among lower dimensional manifolds inside. It's like I said about your brain. You don't need to record the incredibly high dimensional memory of what happened to you five years ago. It can be stored for all purpose, the purposes that you need it for survival and whatever. Uh, in a much with many fewer data points. So many data sets that appear to require many variables, the variables here being the parameters, can actually be described by a comparably smaller number. And so this principle is actually why machine learning works. I mean, it's a sort of philosophical, mathematical description of why uh, uh, interpretation of what happens in a neural network. So what you're doing when you do gradient descent in a, in a highly dimensional space is you're searching in this enormous space of tens of thousands or millions or trillions of parameters. But really the idea is that if it's going to be effective, if you're going to find an answer, it has to be something that's represented with fewer dimensions. And so Here's your original space. Um, if you don't sample it with enough points, you're, when you interpolate, you don't get accurate information. But at some point, you can sample it in such a way that the errors are really pretty unusually rare. You don't need every point on that line if you if you don't get enough information, enough dimensions, you won't be able to interpolate. And, and neural networks interpolate, okay? So um, one more way of thinking about this. Before you train, before you train, the model starts with some random, you have a binary classification problem. You wanna separate points in, like this is the blobs, right? Um, and you want to separate them. And it starts with some random way of thinking about it. And then when you start to train, your model works towards a better fit that classifies things more correctly. And then at some optimal point, okay, a robust fit is gotten, which actually is that manifold, which actually is that lower dimensional space. You, you don't need all of the information of the data set. You've, you've figured out how much of it you need to store. And yes, there's some errors, you know, 
there's some errors, but it's about as those are exceptions. You're learning the patterns in the data, which are pretty much this line. And then as you keep learning, oh, it's going to develop, it's going to over, it's going to try too hard. So here is where you want to be. When you test it, you want new, you know, when you give it new data, you want it to use that, that generalized understanding of the data that was able to ignore the outliers and come to an understanding of what the fundamental pattern is in your data. If you go beyond that, well, then you end up with a fussy model that doesn't generalize well. So the point is this sweet spot between knowing too much about your information and not enough about your data set. OK. But here's a surprise. Here's the thing that's really interesting. What time do I have here? Um, here's the thing that's really interesting. I'm probably going to run over, but if you have to leave, that's fine. I'll, this will be recorded. Here's the thing that is surprising. You want a model that can overfit. Your goal is not to cut it off and find the smallest model, and so therefore it doesn't overfit. Overfitting is not a sign that something is wrong. It in fact shows that it has sufficient power to you have room to, you know, room to move. You have you have enough power that you can comfortably learn your data without stressing. It's like, it's like, you know, a car that it can go fast enough and you don't need that speed, but it, you need it sometimes, right? You, you need to have that comfort zone. Um, maybe that's not a great example. So overfitting is, an, is, 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 evidence that your model is complex enough to learn your data. In fact, it has so much power that it's overusing that power. So the first big, this is from Cholet. It's, uh, he's the guy that invented uh, or developed Keras, the front end to TensorFlow. It's right, a very nice book. Um, and I used to use it, but now I'm using PyTorch. But he says the first big milestone of a learn machine learning project, getting a model that has generalization power. It can beat the trivial baseline and it is able to overfit. You have to beat your baseline or else you're not doing anything. But then you want enough, you want enough power that you can overfit and then you want to back off. You don't want to overfit, but you want the power to be able to overfit. So you should always be possible to overfit. Now, how do we how do we actually deal with this practically? How do we do, how do we get that sweet spot? Um, there's various techniques. I'm going to go through a bunch of them. One of the least useful for NLP is augmentation. It's often very very useful for image data. It's often very useful for audio data. Uh, for image data, if you want it to be able to recognize tennis balls, well, put it in every possible orientation because the orientation doesn't matter. If you have a kitten, put the kitten in all these things, you know, change this, change, you know, the lighting, change the contrast. That's not the point, right? With audio, you can add background noise. You can make it louder, or softer. You can change the, you can do a lot of things to audio and to image data. It's not as useful for NLP. Um, it's a little tricky because what you want to do is manipulate your existing data um, so that it has the same essential information in it. What does that mean with text? not clear it's not clear it's it's pretty complicated um what what's out there what people try to do is replace words by synonyms you know instead of saying fast you say speedy um and say, instead of saying boy you say lad <laughs> But that, that does change it. It's not exactly the same. And people look in the embedding space and find a word that's nearby and replace it. 
it's not very satisfying. It, it doesn't work quite as well. Another thing that's been, uh, um, and this is complicated, but maybe self-referential, like, you know, if you want to work on translation, translate into another language and then translate it back and use that as another sample. None of these are very satisfying. So augmentation is difficult without knowing more about the domain. Uh, how else do we get a better model? Well, you can try a different architecture. <laughs> That's kind of the radical fix. Add more layers or maybe fewer layers or different widths. Start with wider layers and go narrower. That's a fairly typical design decision. Consider different kinds of layers that are better suited to your data. Now, this is really better for images than NLP. Um, convolutional layers don't really work for NLP. They're not very useful. Um, this is advice that people in the department, the experienced researchers, Google around, see what other people have done. <laughs> Not very satisfying, but ultimately that is something you may, you have to do. Um, that's sort of the radical thing to do. You can tune the hyperparameters, okay? Um, play with the hyperparameters, the type of optimizer, the learning rate, hugely important. If you're getting bizarre answers, if you're just getting bizarre behavior, it's often true that your learning rate is in the wrong place. And the typical thing to do is set it much lower. When it's too big, you're going to get chaotic results. Uh, batch size, every, every possible hyperparameter. Hyperparameters, not the parameters inside the model, the weights on the on the connections, but the parameters, you know, when you set your model. Um, you can play with those and try to improve your validation. It's a bad idea to do that with an eye in your test score because then you're just tuning to the test, right? Um, better feature engineering. Features being whatever is input into the network. Uh, you can use domain knowledge. Uh, are there relationships between the information going in? Um, do you have some experience with the model and you can somehow understand it? Um, what kind of word vector? You know, what 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 one works better? Term frequency, you add inverse document frequency, stop words, not stop words. Um, use embeddings that you figure out yourself. We're going to do one in the fourth assignment to use embeddings, various kinds of embeddings, different choice of embeddings. So better ways of representing the information to your neural network, you can always consider. Um, there are some simple cases, and I, I'm not aware of being able to do this for anything very complicated, but for example, in the naive Bayes, uh, particularly in SK Learn, you can actually look and see which features played the biggest role um, in a classification problem. Like this, this was a classification problem of given male, given a bunch of names, identify whether they're male or female. Uh, this afternoon, I went through Shakespeare and I categorized by hand all of the characters or most of the characters, um, male or female. Well, it was easy, actually. Uh, if queen was in the title, well, that was a male, a uh, female. If ping, well, that was a male. Uh, if, if it ended in A, it was female. If it ended in O, it's a male. So he had this sort of naive view of Italian names. Um, but, you know, here it turns out, for example, you know, N.A. was uh, a very strong indicator that something was female and played a significant role. So, you know, if if certain features are more important, maybe those can be emphasized. They can be weighted more. You can just have a weighted sum going into the network. It's not that isn't as useful in in deep learning. Here's another idea, early stopping. Um, this is really not, this is what you wanna do is basically stop when you get the robust fit before you get into overfitting. Um, notice that the robust fit is where your 
validation curve is at the lowest. Typically, your training curve in terms of loss is going to keep going down because you're going to keep learning more if you have sufficient power. But if you identify the place where the validation is best, that's a pretty strong indication that that's a good model. So early stopping, um, stop training when a robust fit is achieved. And, and you, you can be many indications of that. Um, one thing that I've used with good effect is save the best model with respect to the validation loss. Uh, basically what you do is as you train your model, you always save every five, you know, maybe every five epics or maybe every epic. Um, you 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 save the model which is best so far with respect to the validation score. And then you end up with a model which is optimal in terms of how it did on the validation, which is your test your held out set that should tell you how well you're doing. Um, and that that has worked very well for me. I've done that a number of times and that has worked very well. But there's other ways to there's other ways to do it's called early stopping. Uh, and there are more sensitive tests uh, in PyTorch in various languages there are ways to do that in PyTorch there you can just look up early stopping PyTorch and it'll tell you how to do it. But uh but a, a very standard thing would be the minimum when you've achieved the best result with your validation loss, lowest. Um, and then here's one more, and I think I'm I'm almost I'll run a little bit over. Um, and it's this is very counterintuitive to me, but regularization is basically hampering the power of the model somehow. In other words, you have this immense amount of power. Think of a car that has this incredible amount of power to go very fast. And maybe you wanna make it harder to abuse so you don't kill yourself. So maybe the pedal doesn't, you know, there's some way of controlling all that power. Um, that's what regularization is. It actively impedes the model's power to fit the data with the goal of making it perform better during validation because it's not just using all that power. The model is simpler and more regular. Now, one way to do it, it's just reduce the model size, meaning the number of parameters. Make it smaller, make it, you know, just reduce the number of parameters. Um, and you can see here in this example, um, a smaller model gets to a lower that we're taking here the validation, the minimum validation loss as the measure, you know, that's doing as well as it can do. And you can see that it takes a few more epics, but you actually get a lower score than you do with a larger model, you know? And uh, this is a, this is a fairly straightforward thing. It's not as easy to do, and it's has some caveats. The more common, the more common thing to do uh, is called, and it's been studied fairly carefully, is called weight regularization. And that basically says that the weights, the parameters, the values of the connections, you can't let them get too extreme, either way too small, this huge range of values to a million to a negative million, this enormous, you know, think of the ability of a weight to store information is dependent upon its range. It has some precision, but if you allow it, if you, if you hold it between zero and one, there's less information you can store in there than if it goes to its full range. And so what you can do is place uh, a limit in the following sense I'll describe on how big the weights can become. And there's various ways to do this. Um, L1 regularization, 
And L1, L2 are like these loss, um, loss functions. L1 is absolute value. Um, L2 is the square. L3 is the cube and so forth. Um, and basically the L1 norm of the weights is you take the absolute value of the weight coefficients and you add them to the cost of the model. So the bigger the values get, the worse the performance, the cost. At the end, when you calculate the cost, the loss, you add this term with some alpha, with some weight, okay? It's added, you know, in some weighted way to the, to the loss. Um, and so what happens is it can't, you know, if, if it gets too complicated, then it starts affecting the, the loss and it becomes worse. And so basically what you're asking it to do is find another way to learn the information without making these weights enormous. This is a fairly common thing to do, the L2. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a fairly, and it's in most systems, it is, it is, uh, it is uh, automatic. They do something like that. Okay, now here's one that I think is truly weird. And I think this is the last slide. Yeah, let's end on this truly weird idea, which works really well. It's bizarre. It's called dropout. And dropout basically says, and you add a dropout layer. You have a layer and then you add another layer, which is a dropout. And what that does is, with some probability, say P equals 0 0.5, it's not unusual to do 0.5. It sounds crazy, but it works really well. When you pass some values, now this is in a square, but you're really talking about 16, a layer of 16. When it goes to the next layer, with 50% chance, you just turn it into zeros. Just get rid of it. You're just erasing information that your network has calculated. Why is this? Why does this work? And it's really one of the weirdest great ideas. There's a bunch of them, but this is one of the ones that I find truly strange. But it seems like it couldn't help, but it's one of the most effective ways to, to regularize your model. Because what it means is you can't just memorize little tiny pieces of the data and store it somehow in the network. It's got to learn it in an overall way. And I, I don't know if I can an, a, analogize this to, you know, the way we learn things, but, you know, when you learn something over a long period of time, you forget things. At least I do. And so then you come back to it and you learn, and you are learning in the presence of constant forgetting. And so we tend to learn best over time. This is why don't study everything the night before. Study it over a period of time because you'll forget things, but the important things will come through and then you learn something else and it gets put together. And learning in the presence of forgetting is a powerful idea. And that's what this is doing. It's not just memorizing, it can't memorize because you keep disturbing its ability to just memorize. It's like, it's trying to sit there and memorize a textbook and every, and you keep, you keep delete, ripping pages out and giving it random pieces. Of, and it can't memorize it. It's got to learn the overall principles. Well, that's the best I can do to explain it. But it's, it's really very strange. And so basically, you add a layer to the network. This is in Keras, but in PyTorch, it's just a very simple line. And you give it the percentage. And when it passes information to the next level, it just deletes it randomly. It's it's really sort of magic. Now, of course, your network needs to be powerful enough that it can be subjected to this. If you're tightly, you know, just learning exactly what you need to learn, it's got to be big enough. But memory is cheap. Neurons are cheap. So anyway, let me stop here. I went a little bit over. Sorry. Um, if anybody has any questions or any concerns or anything, I can hang out. Otherwise, I'll put this on the web and uh, get going. You're going to get another assignment tomorrow night. And should be fun. I've been having a lot of fun with it. Too much fun. Uh, and then I will see you all next week.
Okay. Anybody have any questions? Anything you want to talk about? Projects? Let me know if you want to talk about projects. Uh, I've already had people come to me. Just make an appointment. We'll get on Zoom and we'll talk about what your interests are. Okay. I put a little bit on uh, on Piazza today. Uh, some ideas, but let me know. Okay. All good. <laughs> okay.